Okay, so the beautiful thing about hip hop turning 50 this year is it means we finally get a chance to pause and kind of get nostalgic about hip hop's bygone eras. And it also turns out there's pretty good money in hip hop nostalgia. Today on the show, as rap ages gracefully, who really benefits? I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, there's only one way to kick this off, right? Hit it. Don't do that. Don't do the thing where you pretend I don't know what you're talking. You don't know what I'm talking about. That is LL Cool J. He's performing his giant hit, Mama Said Knock You Out. That was last year at his Rock the Bells concert. And you may have noticed right now, whether it's these packaged tours that have all your favorite rappers from the 90s or online events like these versus battles, right, which is like basically pin, pit one hip hop legend against another in this concert battle or all the rap nostalgia T-shirts that you've got in your closet suddenly becoming like this hot sort of hot item. Rap nostalgia is really big business right now. For example, this weekend, Nelly is bringing his Hot in Here festival to Toronto. It's going to be loaded with all these throwbacks for the 2000s. You got Fat Joe, you got Ashanti, you got Ja Rule, all those people. And later this summer, LL Cool J is going to bring his own brand of throwback concert to Canada. So it kind of seems to me like a good time to dig into the rap nostalgia trend. Dalton Higgins is a veteran rap journalist, and Ian Andre Espinay is a live event producer. I spoke to them about all of this earlier this week. Here's our conversation. Listen, Dalton, first question to you. What makes Rap Nostalgia and a Rap Nostalgia concert different from a regular hip-hop concert? Yeah, well, well, I'd say, you know, what makes these Rap Nostalgia concerts considerably different from your regular rap concert is that you kind of know exactly what you're paying to hear, and, and that's hit records from yesteryear, right? Mm. So, so you're almost intentionally attending these concerts to go in a bit of a time warp and hear all of these throwback hits, you know what I mean? Like right. top 20 songs, all of those sort of catalog radio hit songs, you know, when you go to the mall and you're shopping and you hear, like, you know, that's what you're, <laughs> that's what you're paying to see and, and, and nothing much else, right? Now, if you juxtapose that experience with your typical rap concert today, it's quite the opposite feeling in that you go to a concert, you might be, you know, checking out a one hit wonder or some overnight TikTok sensation. So you're going to hear a bunch of songs being performed that you can't sing all the lyrics to word for word, right? And you're also going to hear, you might even hear unreleased new songs, right. you know what I mean? So it's not a karaoke kind of, you know, sing along thing. They, they sit on polar uh, ends of the spectrum. Well, I was going to say, Ian, like to me, that is the very essence of what hip hop is, right? Like we sort of think of hip hop as a particularly progressive genre. It doesn't, for the longest time, it didn't do nostalgia very well. Mm. But then you've you've kind of been ahead of the curve on this. You've been doing rap and R&B nostalgia events since the late 90s. But before that, you were a party promoter with your finger on the pulse of, you know, the, everything that was hot in black music. Mm. When did you shift like when did you realize that there's actually an appetite for all these big throwback events um around 1999 when i created amnesia um we were entering the 50 cent era and um you know toronto parties have always kind of played like old school like an old school set quote unquote but as the the 50 cent era um kind of and the hardcore hip-hop era emerged and became more dominant i started to notice that the audience was really responding more favorably to the old music to the heavy d's and to the to the big daddy canes in the 90s um what i call golden era hip-hop so you know i i realized that there was a real appetite for it and so when i said that i was going to produce an event that played all old school music be it hip-hop or r&b dance or even house music people said i was crazy right but, right you know, in a way, Amnesia kind of ushered in an old school renaissance in the Canadian club scene that really never left, um, that we're kind of seeing today um, in these like Rock the Bells and, and other concerts of those sorts. So there's a growing demand for rap nostalgia. What's different now, though, is that you have acts like LL Cool J, you got acts like Nelly, even Usher. They're sort of strategically building a whole event around being a nostalgia brand around themselves. Dalton, what do you think it is making them, you know, what's, what do you think is making them do this at this moment right now? Well, well, I would say, I think there are a few things at play here. Um, for one, I think it's because, you know, our aging rap heroes, they need the money. All right. Like, right. like pe Just period. Purely point point. money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I also think, you know, playing these rap nostalgia events, it sort of, 
it sort of beats them having to do like, you know, play the wedding circuit, bar mitzvahs, you know, <laughs> or, or, or doing these, uh, you know, you guys see in the news that they do these sort of a uh, lot of rap icons and icons in general, they do these sort of sketchy private gigs for dictators, you know, who violate human rights <laughs> Yep. and they get paid big bucks, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. so I, I think there's uh, I think there's something to say to that. I also think that a lot of the old school, what we hear directly is, uh, just from a qualitative standpoint, like a good performance, a lot of these old school vets, it's like they know that they can deliver a really great show, um, you know, shows that are arguably, arguably better than much of what we're seeing now. Because like back then you had to actually bring like, the, you know, musicianship and, you know, dancers have actual, actually have a stage presence, you know what I mean? Whereas now you can kind of just like walk back and forth on a stage, rapping to a laptop and then ca call it a concert experience. Right. Um, so I think they see some of the, those, the gap in the industry. Ian, we talked about LL Cool J's Rock the Bells throwback concert series. You know, that feels kind of like a big win for the rap nostalgia audience. But you're a local indie promoter. You've been doing this for a minute now. I'm curious how you see it. Um, I, I think that it's definitely a win for both the old school artists and the and the fans alike, you know, to Dalton's point. Um, those artists are getting an opportunity to capitalize on a culture that they built, that they didn't generally profit from the way that the younger artists are getting to profit today. Um, but for me, as a both a local and independent, and as well as a racialized um, event producer, um, these these large scale um, concert um, throwback concert series that are generally produced like either by um, these large conglomerates or in partnerships between the artists and these large touring companies um, are having, you know, that plus the, you know, the versus effect that's pushed up the prices 400% has had an effect on us where we are not able to, to really um, book the artists that, that we booked in the past right. um, that we, that we largely developed um, you know, in the market, you know, in the words of uh, Poet Laureate, um, Fat Joe, yesterday's price is not today's price. So like, I reached out for somebody for, you know, for Hip Hop 50 in August, and uh, he was $10,000 in 2017 pre pandemic. Yeah. And he asked me for 60k. You know, so, you know it's, it's, it's massively, it's, it's dangerous, because I think, you know, in my, my personal opinion is that, a lot of these um, these events aren't even making money, to be honest with you. I think that they're in the business of building brands which can be sold. I'm, I'm interested in that commoditization because when you take an idea like Versus, which is something that Timbaland and, and Swiss Beats sort of started during uh, the pandemic, I, which was, I, again, simply the idea is here's a live stream of two hip hop artists. They each perform something from their deep catalog. And then you get to be like, hey, this person's a winner. This person's a loser. Um, but what ended up happening is Versus became a massive brand that ended up being sold to a company like Triller for a lot, a lot of money that, you know, they were able to sort of basically turn into a recurring brand and a lot of other artists wanted to join in. So it seems like, Dalton, there's a moment where we're turning to maybe the professionalization of that nostalgia, whereas maybe we didn't have this kind of market for it maybe 10 years ago. What do you make of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, I feel some of uh, Ian Andre Espinay's uh, pain and I used to work in that business, right? Just, you know, he's doing obviously super successful, but like, you know, in, independent promoters cannot compete. I don't, not to sound too defeatist, Ian or Elamine, but if you, you know, maybe it's if you, if you can't, if you can't beat them, join them. You know what I mean? If you can't beat them, join them, you know, partner up with Live Nation. You know, I don't know. So if you can just contextualize this in, in the fact that hip hop turns 50 this year, that means that we're just now getting the first generation of 50, 60 year old rap heads. People have been there since the very beginning. But for years and years, critics have kind of argued that hip hop's older demographic haven't been valued the way that, you know, like older rock demographics have been valued. Like there's so many tours um, and promoters that sort of cater to older rock generations. Why do you think we were just now getting to um, hip hop's older generations? Um, so, I mean, hip hop's just 50, so it's a baby, right, in terms of yeah. like genres of music. But um, hip hop's always been seen as a youth driven music. Like when, when you speak of LL, we were 15, he might have been, you know, he might have been 17, but we were kids. Yeah. Um, that plus the fact that it comes from marginalized communities, the industry didn't think it was, you know, in the words of Biggie, like they never thought hip hop would take it this far. So like they thought it was a fad and that bias against the music has been, it's been continued and what the labels sign and what's pushed on radio and that narrative 
of hip hop as a young people's sport, right? So you see it in these things. My my son called um, something. I was listening to Nas the other day, and he's like, "Are oh, you listening to that dad rap?" You know what I mean? and, <laughs> and it's like it's an it's an intended like you know disrespect that's kind of marginalized the older audience, but. You know, with hip hop kind of reaching 50 this year, there's a lot of recognition about what it's brought. It's the most dominant, prevalent culture in the world, like since who can remember. And so there's been a lot of conversation around its historical and its cultural significance and the value of what it's brought to the world. Right. So, yeah. you know, the industry is always playing catch up to my point earlier. And a lot of the older people who are working there are like afraid to be called old. There's this ageism thing that goes on in hip hop where people don't want to be like dads or something or, you know what I mean? But in not acknowledging this demo, they're leaving a lot of money on the table with this with this demographic that has tons of money. Dalton, last word to you on this. Does the rise of all of these sort of rap nostalgia brands, does that feel like a step in the right direction to you? Yeah, it, it is a step in the right direction. I mean, it, it is that, you know, Ian spoke to, yeah, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, hip-hop is about the here and now. What's it, you know, youth culture and it's trend-setting. But then on the flip side, the ageism and hip-hop thing is it's a real thing. You know, it's a, I, even when we talk about this, it sort of makes my blood boil, knowing that, uh, you know, rock and uh, country uh, icons, they get paid more as they age and, uh, you know, uh, hip-hop rappers uh, get paid less. Hmm. Um, but I would say, you know, as far as these rap nostalgia, uh, you know, uh, concerts and, and festivals, of which there are plenty, they're just cranking them out now. Um, so it's like 2023 feels like, you know, 1991 all over again. Like that's just what's happening. I, I would say that, uh, you know, on the one, on the one hand, it, it, it's, it's so, it's kind of cheesy. Like it's so cheesy that it's good, right? Like it's all these, you know, hits from the eighties, you know, <laughs> like some, some much music hits from the eighties thing. Uh, when all of a sudden done, I think it's a step in the right direction to pay our rap icons, uh, the types of monies that they deserve to be paid, you know, as they're, they're icons, they should get paid properly, you know? Well, Dalton, Ian, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eleni. I was, I was singing every word of that. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, that is a throwback to 2002. That's Nelly, Kelly Rowland, and that's Dilemma. Before that, you heard my conversation with Dalton Higgins, who's a publicist and veteran music journalist, and Ian Andre Espinay, who's a live event producer and music equity activist. If rap nostalgia is your thing, you can catch Nelly's Hot in Here tour. It's coming this Saturday in Toronto. And also, LL Cool J's The Force concert series has a Canadian tour date also in Toronto on August 18th. Uh, You know what? Keep coming back to Commotion because we are going to be doing a lot of celebrating when it comes to the 50th anniversary of hip hop. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, I want to be careful about this next story because it's a really sensitive one and it's also taken up a lot of conversation right now. Every now and then you get one of these news stories, right? One of these news stories where it feels like everyone in the whole world is carefully watching. And right now, that story is a situation that's happening about 700 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland. There's there's this frantic rescue mission unfolding to reach a submersible that has not been reached for a few days. And I want to be very clear here. This next discussion is not about anything that is happening specifically with the vessel. But there's been a lot of reaction online to the story. And I and many others have noticed that social media has kind of turned the story into memes, into jokes, into little shareable quips. Honestly, it's made me a little uncomfortable. So I wanted to talk this out. I wanted to talk out this discomfort. I wanted to talk. I wanted to sort of understand why the story has generated so many memes, what the memification of disaster tells us about ourselves. So to talk about all of this, I'm joined by Mike Isaac, a tech reporter for the New York Times. Mike, good morning. 
Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. Listen, I want to, first of all, I want to ground us in the time that we're talking. So we're talking Thursday morning right now. I don't know what's going to unfold as this story keeps happening. Yeah. There's this old saying that, you know, um, comedy equals tragedy plus time. It feels like time is not a lot of time. Like it's down to just a few minutes. After the news broke of the story on Monday, how long was it, would you say, before you saw people start to like make memes about this? Oh, man, I it had to have been almost instantly basically if as folks started figuring out you know what you know what is happening oh there's a bunch of people trapped underwater in the submarine and then you know i think the as really as like more of the kind of crazy details started coming out is mm-hmm. when folks uh, i think just sort of weren't able to really believe it but at the same time you know, start sort of memeing and joking about it just because the the whole situation was so absurd, frankly. Yeah. So, but also, like, we are kind of in this weird moment where there's so many awful stories, awful tragedies happening. What do you think yeah. it is about this story that made it um, particularly, like, fertile grounds for people making a lot of memes? Yeah, totally. I mean, to your point, like, I think the – the amount of time it has taken to turn sort of crazy events into internet memes has really sped up over the years, but this is, yeah. this has been a long, a sort of long time coming, I think across the internet, you and I are both very online people, I would say. Yes. And so we, <laughs> and so we have seen like different events and, and how, you know, really spectacle kind of turns into a moment for people across Twitter or Facebook or whatever to, you know, weirdly connect because it's a shared experience, right? Like it's similar to like a football game or, you know, uh, you know, almost, you know, absurdly enough, like just sort of, this is people watching the same thing and commenting on it. But I think the, the details around this case are particularly just sort of um, strange enough that made a lot of people just sort of be like, how do I even deal with this? And frankly, like the fact that the, potential you know the ways that these people could you know potentially die are horrible you know like all of the outcomes that would have them expire are basically just really not great and so i think just alleviating any sort of uncomfortable feelings around that often comes out in in humor i think there is there is that element of like we turn to the absurd to deal with the possibility of death and with the, the yeah. idea of like you, listen this is a story that's dominating death is a part of it potentially we don't know what's happening here but the fear of death that is you know that's one of the tools that we turn to but mm. it felt like the speed of it is like nothing i've ever seen before like before we even know what's happening with these people it's just the the simple potential of death existing in the story was yeah. was something that pulled people towards that absurdity. And it felt, to me anyway, it felt too fast, also too insensitive, given yep. the stakes of the story. Yeah, no, 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 totally. And like the, you know, I think it's also because this sort of event, you know, not this particular event, but like situations in which everyone kind of comes together online and understands that something, you know, bad or big is happening and how do we deal with it has happened so many times before in let's say the past i mean twitter's been around for 18 years and so uh or 17 or 18 years i want to say and so like there have been these big moments i mean and we can go back to things that are of real serious consequence in um you know you know uh, almost i guess a decade ago now uh you know when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed. Yeah. It became a whole Twitter thing, right? Or when Trump uh got COVID, it was like a a bunch of like Twitter commentary almost immediately. And so yeah. I think people are just sort of acclimating to what this means online faster now compared to when Twitter and Facebook were a novelty and yeah. people didn't know how frankly like how to express themselves or how they felt comfortable expressing themselves online but to your point about like i'm uncomfortable this is making me feel weird there are also these immediate pushbacks and counter waves of like why are we talking about this in this way you know and i think that discourse has it, it we're on like a longer path that you know seems to be compressing over time and i'm very curious i don't know where it goes next exactly but that the the window is getting shorter each time i guess i guess we should give people some kind of 
um, reference to like what these memes are. There's a lot of poking mm. fun of the very of, of the wealthy passengers on the submersible potentially. Um, I'll tell you some of the memes that I've that I've seen that kind of made me go, oh, that makes me really uncomfortable. There's a few TikToks going around of um, somebody sort of pretending to be like the passengers on the submersible, but they're on a reality TV show and they're having sort of conversations <laughs> with each other. And that like it, honestly it was it was really difficult to watch that. Um, yeah. There I've seen some people uh, sort of spam the Amazon uh, review page of the Logitech controller that is, you know, has become a central piece of the story. They're oh. giving it reviews and the reviews are deeply insensitive. Like they're, they're, it's just it just feels like the insensitivity is mounting up. I would say it's true. Social media has had this long history of providing some opportunity for levity to process truly horrifying stories. But when I think about, for example, the earliest example that I can think of this is, is you know, um, Gen Z's uh, potential of using um, 9-11 memes, but that was like oh, uh, sure. several years later, right? Yep. Um, the notion that this would begin immediately felt like it says something about our humanity in a moment of tragedy. What do you think it says? I No, that's a really good point. I think, uh, you know, I was thinking about this, uh, I think about this a lot just as tech reporting and what social media sort of has evolved as and done to our brains and how we process things and how we deal with them online. And yeah. the internet, um is is this force that both you know i argue with technologists about this all the time you know it has produced um uh great sums of wealth and great sums of um maybe potential to uh regain equality in areas where there's inequality but at mm -hmm. the same time it's also um <laughs> exacerbated a lot more inequality as well as like sort of afforded a, a kind of distance between people ironically you yeah. know even though we've never been more connected we're also sort of more distant from the realities of what this would mean like are you going to make these jokes if you were in the press conference uh announcing this stuff you know or if I you're gonna talk to like the the family members involved. Like, I just, I do think it just removes us a few steps from reality in a sense. What do you, I have like maybe like a minute left here, but can we just sure. talk a little bit about how the Blink-182 element of the oh, story man. sort of made it worse? Because I think maybe people might not be aware of that if you're not extremely online. Totally. That was almost surreal. Like basically the, the, one of the passengers, the, I think he's a billionaire passenger yeah. has a, has a stepson who seems to be a little bit out there but he's like got a very much an online personality and people found his twitter account and then he began tweeting about how he was going to go to the blink 182 concert that night to grieve and it became this yeah. whole thing right and like then you know then it sort of gone went off the rails and he immediately got canceled for like fighting with these other people and then sure. doing like crazy so it was just like these weird subplots that every twist and turn honestly were tailor made for how the internet works and how the, the, the feeling of we need new weird parts to this story can make people one up themselves. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of fed into this Mimi remix culture, if that makes sense. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. Um, sure. So I'll give you the last word here. When you see the story unfolding, what do you think it says about where the internet is headed? Do you think? I yeah like I really <laughs> I worry about this stuff a lot of the time you know like on, on the one hand it's this for many people weirdly uh let's say way to alleviate tension in a really horrible moment for particular folks yeah. but at the same time like what are the next events that people are able to joke about in a way that gives them um distance but you know doesn't connect them to what the reality is of what's happening you know yeah. i just worry that it like as hyper connected as we are there are ways in which it disconnects us from what's going on in the world and i i don't know the long term effects of that but it it's concerning i guess to me Mike, that's exactly why I wanted you on here because I have the same concerns. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thank you so much for your time. Right on. Thanks for having me. Uh, of course. Mike Isaac is a tech reporter for the New York Times. He joined me from his home in Oakland to talk about the social media response to how this submersible saga is currently playing out. And that is it for our show today. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. I'm going to be here tomorrow. We're going to have a wider conversation about the biggest pop culture stories of this week. I hope that you're going to join us. I'll see you then.